All right. Well, thank you, uh, Ifon and Crystal. Thanks for that uh, interview, and, and that, thank you to that great interviewer up there. Pretty, uh, pretty, pretty cool guy. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, yeah, by the end of today's service, you guys are really going to be sick of seeing me, so um, I'll try to keep the message a little shorter. Uh, today, I do have the privilege of being able to share uh, just what God is doing, and uh, you know, it's, it's really cool. Um, we just started this message series called More Than a Story, and uh, what it is is essentially just taking a lot of our favorite uh, childhood Bible stories that we grew up with, that we heard in Sunday school, and uh, just being able to unpack them, but beyond just the story, be able to see them from a perspective that, what, you know, what is God trying to teach us as adults? What can we glean from that? And so um, last week, Pastor Dwayne kicked us off with the story of creation, appropriately, as the first one. And so today we're going to continue that in uh, the book of Genesis uh, 3 with uh, the story of Adam and Eve. And so we all know this story, and, and uh, it always, you know, kind of bring some giggles, especially when you guys start thinking about the, the fig leaves and all that stuff. But we're going to unpack this a little bit more because there are some pretty big theological elements that go into the story that impact our relationship with Jesus today. Um, it's called, uh, more than the story, The Fall, uh, Paradise Lost. And, and why is it lost? We'll unpack that here in a second. Um, and while this is one of the most famous childhood stories that we do know, it is arguably actually one of the most important chapters in the entire Old Testament because it sets the table for Jesus Christ. Yeah, you heard that right. I believe this is actually one of the most important chapters in the entire Old Testament because without Genesis 3, we would not understand the need for a great Savior. I'm going to go ahead and start with a word of prayer as we uh, come and reflect Lord God, thank you for giving us this opportunity today to be able to hear from your word. Pray, Holy Spirit, that you would give us insight and wisdom in not just the knowledge that is on these pages, but how it applies to how we can be faithful disciples, how we can be followers of Christ and grow more passionately like you as a result of it. Illuminate us today. In your name we pray. Amen. Well, we're going to go ahead and start with just the reading of Genesis 3, and it's a bit long. But um, I've asked you to go ahead and pull that up on your Bible, your app, or you can just go ahead and look on the screen as we go through Genesis 3. I'll be reading from the ESV translation, okay? Here we go. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God actually say, you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, You shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, You will surely not die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing God and evil. Not knowing good and evil, sorry. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate, and she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. And they heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and the man and his wife hid themselves themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. And he said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, the woman who you gave to be with me, she gave me fruit of the tree and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this that you have done? And the woman said, the serpent deceived me, and I ate. Verse 14, the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. 
I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, you shall bruise his heel. And to the woman, he said, I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing. In pain, you will you shall bring forth children, and your desire shall be contrary to your husband, but he shall rule over you. And to Adam he said, Because you have listened to the voice of your wife, and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread, till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken. For you are dust, and to dust you shall return. The man called his wife's name Eve, because she was the mother of all living. And the Lord God made for Adam and for his wife garments of skins and clothed them. Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil. Now lest he reach out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him out from the Garden of Eden to work the ground from which he was taken. He drove out the man, and at the east of the Garden of Eden he placed the cherubim and a flaming sword that turned away every, every way to guard the way to the tree of life. Now, that's a pretty lengthy chapter, and we can start by saying that this chapter is essentially divided into three parts. Uh, first is the fall, verses 1 through 7. Uh, the next section would be the consequence, which is the consequences of Adam and Eve's sin, verses 8 through 13. And then the last section, which uh, could be simply called the curse, verses 14 until the end. Now, as I said before, it's a, it's a really, really loaded chapter. And, and honestly, I think uh, just to do this chapter, you could spend a month um, doing message series on this. So for that reason, today I'm only going to be focusing on the first part, which is the fall, verses 1 through 7. But in a nutshell, just to make sure that we have continuity, when the fall happens, right, we're in a place where Eve and Adam are in this uh, place of shame, of guilt, and it only gets worse, to be honest with you. They have consequences of their sin. God goes looking for them in the garden, and he's asking, where are you? And they're hiding right? And then when he catches up to them and he's asking more questions, they're not even owning up to the responsibility. They're shifting the blame, right? Adam is like, man, you know, though the woman who you gave to me, she gave it to me. So he's blaming the woman. He's blaming God. He's not even taking responsibility. And then when God confronts Eve, she's like, well, the serpent, he deceived me. It's not my bad. And that's why I ate it. And so you can see this downward spiral in the consequences of their sin, and so it leads us to the curses, which is the last section of the chapter. God first curses the serpent, and that's why you hear and you see the serpent today, most commonly referred to as a snake on its belly. Um, he curses uh, Satan, and talking about just a prophetic foreshadowing of what's to happen with when Jesus Christ comes to ultimately crush him. And then, and then God curses the woman as we know with um, pains in, in childbirth, and the curse to man with as he toils over the ground in labor. Really, really meaty chapter, and we do need to see it in its entirety. But like I said, today I want to focus primarily on the first seven verses because I feel that this, again, sets the stage for why it's so magnificent, wonderful, and impactful in the New Testament when Jesus comes to restore all things. Because this is the chapter where things get broke. Now, last week, P.D. established at the end of creation that things were good, right? At the end of the first day, second day, third day, he was like, it is good, it is good, it is good. And in fact, at the end of the sixth day, God said, it is very good, right? So here we have this beautiful garden. We have paradise, which is it's referred to. Adam and Eve have free reign. They can go anywhere. They have all the food that they can eat. Uh, the best part of it is that they get fellowship with God, right? God is like 
seen and, and referred to in Scripture as walking in the garden. I mean, how cool is that, right? To be able to be in that kind of communion with God, literally, and have everything that you want. And so we go from this place at the end of chapter 2 where everything is very good. I dare say almost perfect. What happens? Well, chapter 3 is called the fall because you can only go down when you're at a place that is very good. And that's exactly what happens. My premise for today is that what happened in chapter 3 is that Satan lays out a plan to deceive Adam and Eve the same way that he actually does today. He begins with us questioning God, then to doubting God, then to distrusting God, and then finally disobeying God. If we can bring up Genesis 3.1, we'll start there. It says, Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Did God actually say, You shall not eat of any tree in the garden? So let's stop right there. First of all, verse 1 establishes that there is this character, the serpent, and he's described as crafty. Now, what does that mean? Does that mean that when God was creating serpents, that they are actually more cunning, crafty, wise than every other beast that he created? That wasn't noted in the first couple of chapters. And so what's the difference here? Well, the difference here is that this particular serpent, this serpent mentioned here in chapter 3, is the one that is actually inhabited by the presence of Satan. God isn't calling serpents themselves more crafty, but he's saying that this particular one is because it contains a supernatural, cunning, scheming, deceiving person, well, not person, but um, creation like Satan. And so he's inhabited this serpent. Now, you might go, well, wait a minute. I don't remember in verse, the first two chapters where God created Satan, or where, where do these guys come from? Where were the angels? Well, actually, as, as Pastor Dwayne mentioned last week, um, the account of Lucifer, was, what was his name, with the angels, actually predates the creation of the earth. In fact, Lucifer was not just an angel. He was arguably the brightest and most beautiful angel that God had out there. And, and some uh, theologians have even said, yeah, he's been, he was like God's worship leader. Um, that's, that's kind of a scary thought, actually. But as this beautiful angel was up there and, and was just um, so revered, he gained pride. He felt like, wow, I'm actually a pretty big shot here. And actually, I think I can be on equal terms with God himself. That's a pretty crazy thought, but that's what happened when Lucifer got that going in his mind. Pride crept in. And so we see an account of that in Isaiah 14, verses 12, 14. It's, it's described here as, as kind of the mindset of what Lucifer at that point was going through. And it says, I will ascend to heaven above the stars of God. I will set my throne on high. I will set on the mount of assembly in the far reaches of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. That's pretty audacious, but that's pretty much what Satan was thinking at that time. And, and so in his pride and thinking that he could be equal with God, he takes his legion of angels and, and it's stated in scripture that there were a third of them that went with him. And so there was this massive war. Okay, and we can hear a little bit about the war in Revelation 12. Let's look at Revelation 12, 7 to 9. If we can pull that up. Now war arose in heaven, Michael and his angels fighting against the dragon. The dragon here is Satan. And the dragon and his angels fought back, but he was defeated, and there was no longer any place for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent who was called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. 
So it's a clear account of what happened when Satan and a third of the angels tried to war against God, utterly defeated. God cast them down. And so here we are. Satan is defeated. He knows that he cannot take on God. He know, he's tried that, and he's been humbled. But is that going to stop him? No, because you know what? He hates God. He wants nothing to do with submitting to the authority of God, and he doesn't want to see God glorified. So if he knows that he can't defeat God, what's the next best thing? Well, Satan sets his eyes on the pinnacle prize of God's creation, which is mankind. And he knows that angels themselves cannot procreate. Humanity can. And so he's intrigued by that. And he's like, man, I am going to go after God's ultimate creation. Now, it's mentioned in the, in the Hebrew here, the, the word tanin, which refers to uh, kind of a, a, a dragon or a, a serpent, right? And we get this picture of what the serpent was like in chapter 3, that he was, you know, probably had legs. He was definitely upright, and he was walking. And so one of the first questions that comes to mind probably is in verse 1, when he comes up and starts talking to Eve, is like, what in the world was, was Eve thinking? Here comes this walking serpent right up to her. And not only walking, he starts talking, right? Nowhere in the first couple of chapters is it mentioned that any of the beasts that Adam was out there naming actually had a conversation with him. So that should have been Eve's first clue that something was a little off here and something weird was going on. Let's go back to 3.1. Satan asked her, did God actually say, you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And this is important because, number one, this is actually the first question that is printed in Scripture. Up until this point, there hasn't been a question out there. And up to this point, Adam and Eve had had no reason to question God. Everything was good, right? Everything was provided for them. Why would you even need to, to question God? But this is where Satan is clever. This is where Satan is conniving. And here he introduces the concept to Eve of being able to question God. And you notice here's something subtle too, that in chapter 2, it's always mentioned when we're talking about God after the creation of man, that he's referred to as the Lord God. The Lord God did this, the Lord God went there, the Lord God said that. But Satan here, from the get-go in chapter 3, does not say did the Lord God actually say? He said, did God actually say? You can see right off the bat, Satan hates God. Satan does not want to acknowledge God's sovereignty. And so he was already starting to play a mind game with Eve. And in fact, if you look at this sentence, right, did God actually say, you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? That's kind of a, a reversal of the statement that God actually said, right? As we know in chapter 2, God said, hey, you know what? You can eat of every tree in the garden. You just cannot eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It was a very positive blessing. It was a pronouncement that said, everything here is good. Don't touch that one tree, but everything is good. But Satan doesn't focus on that. Satan actually twists this question around and says, oh, did he actually say you can't eat of any tree in the garden? And so there's like a negative tone, and it actually starts to put God in a negative light. That's what he's trying to do. He's almost trying to paint God now then as someone who's restrictive, or he's trying to inhibit and prohibit Adam and Eve, rather than the fact that God's actually already said everything here is good. But no, Satan focuses on this thing. And unfortunately we see that Eve takes the bait. This is a really important part, because even though this is just the first verse, Eve actually could have quashed this right here. She could have stepped up, and uh, again, like I said, it was, I mean, even the fact that you just saw a walking, talking serpent, that should have raised some questions. Where are you from? Who are you? I have never even seen this before. But she, you know, she just doesn't do that. She could have focused on the the claims and the promises that God has already said in his word and to them about how good he is, about his character, and all his commands. But she drops the ball. 
She doesn't even focus on God. Rather, she focuses on what Satan has brought her attention to, causing her to question. And this is important, folks, because the moment that Eve stops believing and trusting that God is good and, and he's only good, this is where sin gets introduced. This is where sin starts to play because sin is falling short, missing mark of God's absolute holiness. And when we stop believing in that holiness and his goodness and, who, and his character, anything short of that is sin. And so this is a travesty because Eve, right from the get-go, starts to question and does not step up to the plate. Verse 2 what does she say in response to the serpent? And the woman said to him, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden. Well, that's almost right what God said in, in chapter 2. God said, actually, you may eat of every tree in the garden. God was emphasizing the totality of everything that he had created, saying, it is all good. But Eve is already starting to lose sight of that and saying, oh yeah, we can, we can eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden. And so his boundless goodness starts to get lost. Let's look at Genesis 2, 15, 17. And you can see what I was saying when God was talking about the fact that they could eat of every tree of the garden. Eve, unfortunately, misses that point. And so now we've we start to transition from questioning God, which Satan introduced to her, to the second phase of Satan's plan, which is doubting God. Let's look at verse 3. But God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. This is Eve talking, giving her explanation to Satan. There's one problem here. She's embellishing what God said. If we look at the passage that we just looked at in Genesis 2, 15, 17, God never mentions in there that you shall not touch of the fruit of that tree. He just said you should not eat of it. And so what is happening here? What's happening is, is Eve is starting to already start to get this questioning God going through her head, and now it's even starting to go on this downward slope towards doubting God. Yeah, you know what? Uh, God said, you know, we're not supposed to eat of that tree, and you know, he, we, we're not even supposed to touch it. Really? But that kind of is an expression right there where Eve is now added onto that. And remember, that's not what God said at all. And the problem now is that Eve is having this perspective that God is now even more restrictive, not just eating it, but he can't even touch it. It's clouding her mind. She's starting to doubt who he is and what his word has said. And the, the honest truth, folks, is that when we believe that God has a desire to withhold his best for us, that's a sin. That is not the promise of God. God wants to give his best for us. He wants what is best for us, not to withhold it. He's not a killjoy. But that is the mindset now that Eve is plummeting towards because now she's in that phase where she's doubting God. And it gets worse. Verse 4, But the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die. Now, this is, this is crazy, right? Because he set the table, he's caused Eve to question, now Eve is doubting, now, now Satan is not even being subtle about it. He's just all out, flat out lying. Oh, you, you will not surely die. And by him lying about what God said, he's basically saying that God is a liar. He's lying about the actual judgment and consequences of what's going to happen when you actually eat from the tree by saying, no, 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 it's all good. You're not going to die. It's really sad because we see this crafty, cunning serpent at work but we shouldn't be surprised. If you look at uh, John 8, 44, he's described in there by John as 
the father of lies. That's who he is, church. That's who he is. He is the deceiver of the world. That he is full of lies. And that's his MO. That's, that's what he does. And, and he's really, really good at it. And so what's happening here now is that Eve has these doubts about God. Satan has planted this all out lie to her. And now it's causing her to just go, well, wait a minute. Okay, I thought that I was in communion with God. I thought God loved me, but he was restrictive. He didn't want me to eat this. He said this. And now could he be lying? It's a total repositioning of where God was in her mind. And now who is the one that's actually concerned for her? It's Satan, right? Satan has done this masterful mind job on her that he's just totally turning the tables from where she was in this perfect communion. Remember, it was good, right? We just read that. To now, she is doubting God and heading towards the third part of Satan's plan, which is to have her distrust God. Verse 5 says, For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Now, Eve is thinking, okay, okay, say you're, say you're correct. Say you're saying God is trying to withhold stuff from us. What, why? Why would God want to do that? Why, why would he? It doesn't seem like he did that this whole time. Why would he restrict? And Satan is clearly coming in with his justification, saying, well, it's because God is, God is flawed. And you know what? God only cares about number one. He's selfish. He's looking out for his own self-interest. That's who he is. I mean, this is so... This, I mean, it's, it's just crazy how, how masterful of a job that he does, and it's unfortunate because we're looking at it from hindsight going, come on, Eve, really? But in that moment, her mind is clouded from questioning to doubt to now distrusting, and Satan has gone for the kill, and he knows it. He's basically painted God as this restrictive God. He limits our freedom. He doesn't care about us. He doesn't like us. And meanwhile, Satan is saying, look, you can eat this. I love you. I'm giving you this freedom. Take your freedom. Take that and, and enjoy it. Make yourself happy. I mean, at that point, you can see why Eve is so enamored with this. And, and, and the tricky thing about this is it's a half-truth, right? Because the verse says that you will be like God, knowing good and evil. And so for us as Christians today, we're, we're always going, yeah, I want to be like God. I want to be like Jesus. That's what, that's, what little, that's what Christians are, right? We're little Christ. We want to be like Jesus. Well, the difference is, for us to be like Jesus, we obey God. But for Eve to be like God, she had to disobey him. That is not in God's plan. That is not what he wanted. That is not what he intended for Eve. But that, unfortunately, is exactly what happens. And so we get to the final part of Satan's scheme where we see the disobedience of God. Verse 6. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate, and she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. By this point, guys, Eve's motivation is, is no longer, it's not even close to where it was the first couple of chapters. Honoring God, being in communion with him, loving him, just being so enamored with her creator. By now, it's about, what do I want? I want to be able to fulfill what I want, because I've already doubted this guy that, you know, I, I thought loved me, because Satan has done a masterful job in, in manipulating her. And so now, her love for God has been essentially replaced with a bunch of, I, w I will do this. I want to do this. I will eat this. I will take this. Well, that's kind of funny, right? Doesn't that kind of remind you of that passage that we just looked at a few minutes ago in Isaiah? I will, I will, I will, I will. Who said the exact same things? And that was Satan. And now he's had Eve essentially being his puppet, doing the exact same thing 
that he said he was going to do to God. 1 John 2, 15 to 16 describes what is happening here. It says, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, and pride of life, is not from the Father, but is from the world. I love this passage because essentially what John is saying here is that these are the things that will follow you in the world, and these are the things that people will, will, will lust after. They'll, they'll seek these things. And guess what? That's exactly the same three things that Eve does here in verse 6. She's seeking this fruit because, number one, she has desires of the flesh. She, what does she do? She looks at that fruit and say, oh, it is good for food. She has desires of the eyes, right? Oh, that fruit is very pleasing. It's a delight for me. And number three, the pride of life. Oh, yeah, I want to eat from that tree because it's going to help me be wiser. Eve falls right in line with the, the, the trap. And, and John outlays that to, to say this is exactly what happens, the trappings of the world. And yet, it's not impossible. It is not irrevocable because it's the same three things that Jesus had to go through. If we look at Luke chapter 4, verses 3 through 12, this is the famous account where Satan, he's already tempted Eve, and he was successful. He's, he was able to make Adam and Eve fall, right? And so here we are in the New Testament, and he's playing the same game, except this time he's like, wow, I got, I got this because Jesus is running on 40 days of no food, and he's alone. He doesn't even have a helper, and he's out there by himself. This is cake, man. This is going to be easy pickings. So he does the exact same thing to Jesus that he did to Eve in verse 6. Look at this. It says, The devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, command this stone to become bread. What is that? Desire for food. Desire of the flesh. But Jesus answers him, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone. See, Jesus didn't even have time to question God. Jesus shuts down Satan right from the get-go with the word of God, right? And so the devil tries the next tactic. The devil took him up and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. What is that? That is desire of the eyes, right? The delight. Everything that you can see is beautiful. And he says to him, To you I will give you all authority and the glory, for it has been delivered to me, and I will give it to him who I will. If you then will worship me, it will be all yours. What does Jesus say? It is written, you shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. I love it. Jesus totally shuts that down. So Satan's like, all right, I got one trick left in my bag. And he took him to Jerusalem and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down from here. For it is written, he will command you, his angels concerning you, to guard you, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. Right? He's saying, look, it's the pride of life. You can go on to the top of this temple, and you can throw yourself, and you will not even be harmed. It worked on Eve. It doesn't work on Jesus. All he says is, it is said, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Jesus essentially fulfills what Eve could not. So right now, you're probably thinking, okay, <laughs> three, uh, through the first five verses, Adam, where art thou? What have you been doing, man? Okay, there's no mention of you. And, and, it's, and it's interesting, right, because uh, he's not in the picture. You know, Satan is deceived Eve. And in fact, some people said, are you sure Adam wasn't also deceived by the serpent? Well, 1 Timothy 2.14 says it plain and clear. It says, and Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and became a transgressor. So it's established that Adam himself was not deceived by the Satan, but he's just as guilty. He's just as culpable. And in fact, God says, you know what, Adam, this is on you. 
If we look at Romans 5, verse 12, and this is a really important verse, but I love this verse because it talks about how sin began. And it says, verse 12, Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men, because all sin. There's a concept here called original sin. And, and basically, in a nutshell, what it means is sin in the world entered through Adam. And with that sin comes physical and eternal death. And because we are all the offspring of Adam and Eve, we, excuse me, we all have this inherited sin in us. It's a sinful nature. We're born with this sin. And this is why, you know, some folks talk about, well, you know, what about, you know, this baby? Or what about, you know, this life here that didn't get a chance to know God? You know what? I don't think there's any exceptions to that. Um, ultimately, everything's up to the Lord. But it says in Scripture that we're all born with that sinful nature. And so the question then begs, why, why does God allow this? Why did God not intervene, and why do we even have this whole charade of sin coming into the world? Why does the corruption happen to his pinnacle of creation? Why does Satan get to do this stuff? Isn't God sovereign? Well, we look a couple of verses later in Romans 12, 15, where it says, but the free gift is not like the trespass, for if many died through one man's trespass, meaning Adam's, much more have the grace of God and the free gift by the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. It's a reiteration that says, yeah, through Adam, we all inherit sin. We are all born of sin. But through Jesus Christ, that grace covers all of that. And in that process, many are saved. God allows sin to happen so that ultimately it could be destroyed and people could be saved through the process. We know this, right? We already know how the ending is going to be. We look at the end of Revelation and we see new heaven, we see new earth. Death and sin, Satan are destroyed in the lake of fire. And the new heaven and new earth have none of that stuff. That is God's ultimate plan. But through this, we're able to see the saving work of grace and justice through Jesus Christ. Romans 12, 18 to 21 then, just a few verses later, sums it up. It says, Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all earth, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. For as by the one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience, the many will be made righteous. Now the law came in to increase the trespass, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more, so that as sin reigned in death, grace might also reign through righteousness, leading to eternal life through, through Jesus Christ our Lord. The trespass affected everybody, but guess what? So does God's act of grace upon the cross for which Jesus died for you and me. It's available. It's there, and it covers, and it defeats what Satan wanted to do. Well, we'll close up with the last verse here, verse 7. And it says, Then the eyes of both were opened, and they know that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. Now, at this point in the story, right, we're, they've already sinned. They already are already feeling guilt because of that. They're also now starting to feel like, you know, these weird feelings like desires and lusts that they did not ever feel but prior to chapter 3. But all these things have been introduced to them now because sin has entered their world and sin has entered their hearts. And they're feeling the consequences now of that. They're feeling shame. And so what do they do? They start to, to at least clothe themselves or try to with these, these fig leaves and, and these loincloths, Right? The thing is, while they had these loincloths, they were only able to be fully covered when God clothed them with the garments of skins 
of animal skins that we read in verse 21. And why is that a subtle, important fact? It essentially means that their sin could not be fully covered without the sacrifice that was made. And that is a beautiful precursor for what is to happen. Because obviously, in the New Testament, we know there are no more animal sacrifices necessary. Jesus Christ pays the sacrifice alone that covers all sins, past, present, and future. In conclusion, the, the enemy has been using the same tactics of lies and deception since the beginning of time to, to cause man to stumble. We saw that back in the garden, and we see that even happening today, right, guys? His pattern of having us question and then doubt and then distrust and then finally disobey, it's, it's a tried and true tactic. I mean, he's been doing it for, for years. And why would he vary from that? Because it tripped people back up then. It still trips people up now. But the cool thing is we can learn and gain wisdom from Adam and Eve's fall. And the reason is because we also have a relationship with the new Adam that was described in Romans, the one who did not give into temptation and the one who ultimately conquered Satan and defeated death on the cross. We put our hope, we put our trust, and we put our lives in the one who reigned back then, today, and forever and his name is Jesus Christ. Let's go ahead and pray. Father God, I thank you for this opportunity today to be able to share what you have shared with us all along. Your desire to not withhold what is best for us, but it has always been to be what is good. And Lord, even though we made the decision to question, doubt, distrust, and ultimately disobey you in the garden and fall, and all mankind has suffered because of it, you provide us a way out. You have provided a way for us to redeem, to be redeemed, and to be reconciled in our relationship to you. And while it was a free gift, it did come at a price. It came at the price of the ultimate sacrifice of your son, Jesus Christ. And so, Lord, I pray that as we go forth from today, that while we are not going to be immune from the temptation of sin, we are aware of his tactics. And not only are we aware of them, we have the power to stop them. We have victory in you, Jesus, because you have already proclaimed that on the cross. We do not have any reason to fear. We do not have any reason to doubt. We do not have any reason to get mired down in the COVID season and, and feel defeated. But because of your promises that are in your word, we know that we can cling to a life and a hope that is not only just eternal, but is here today and is active and thriving and is alive. And his name is Jesus Christ. And we pray that he would fill us in totality, that Holy Spirit would use our lives to the utmost, the power presence of God is in us and we want to be able to live in victory not defeat that is your promise to us and we proclaim it and name it today Lord Jesus in your power we live amen